Amen. It's been a morning, hasn't it? A lot of, a lot of stuff's been going on here lately, and you know, sometimes we have trouble processing when you think about everything that's happening, and you know, a lot of times we don't, we don't see the behind the scenes. We don't, we don't understand everything that's necessarily going on, and. You know, one of the things that, that I've been thinking about a lot this week is, what am I allowing to live rent-free in my head? See, because i got to be honest with you, there's a lot of things living in my head right now. And I, I think it's time for me to evict some of those things. Because with everything going on, I mean, you know, we all know, you know, Pastor Herman's going through some stuff right now. Pastor Shanique is right by his side. My father's going through a lot right now. My, my mom is right there by his side. There's a lot of people that are just going through. And it's, it's constant. It's, it, it seems like there's no break sometimes. And so when we keep going, keep going and keep going and keep going, and there's never a break for us to actually sit down and think about what's going on inside of our heads, then we, we become overrun with thoughts. We become overrun with emotions, and we end up in a situation that I'm going to entitle spiritual mental health warfare. See, because we all know what spiritual warfare is, and we all know what mental health is, but what happens when they come together? See, that's what we're going to talk about today. So if y'all would, I would like y'all to turn to 2 Corinthians Chapter number 10, verse 3, it's the same scripture that we were in last week, but we're going to take a different look at it today. So if you would all stand when you have that, again, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3. I'm only going to read a couple of scriptures um, to get started, and then we're going to dive into it. Amen? Amen. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 10. Verses 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning, Father God, and I ask you to just allow me to be the first hearer of your word, Father God. Allow your message to come forward this morning, Father God. I pray that each and every single person would have a heart to receive your message and that no one would leave the same as they came in today. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for what you are doing and what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You all may be seated. So if we were to take a look at a couple of different definitions, we know what spiritual warfare is. So we know that spiritual warfare is the conflict between the forces of God and the forces of evil in the spiritual realm. See, we know that. We've, pa- we've been taught that. But see, even though this is something that happens in the spiritual realm, everybody wants to take the here and now out of it. Like, oh, you're just going through spiritual warfare. But sometimes we forget, and it's actually foolish to think that spiritual warfare cannot affect our physical lives. See, when we make that disconnect, then we write people off for all kinds of different reasons. And we, we, we don't see the battlefield or the battle that's going on in each and every single person's mind and how that battle can manifest itself physically in, a, in addition to emotionally and spiritually. It can affect your relationships. That spiritual warfare can affect every single area of your life. But see, so that's, that's the spiritual warfare side of it. Mental health is the state of well-being in which we can cope with the normal stresses of life, how we can be productive at work, how we contribute to our community. See, mental health takes on a whole bunch of different aspects, and basically what it really boils down to is something very simple. How clear and focused is your mind? Are you focusing on the correct things? See, that is the single major difference between good mental health 
and bad mental health, and that's the tenants living in your head. So when we let negativity to live in our minds, guess what comes out of our spirit? When we let negativity run our thought lives, it is going to affect everything. It's going to affect the way that we perform at work. It's going to affect our relationships. It will affect the very words that come out of our mouth. I hear some laughter. (laughs) But when we let all that negativity reside, we can't control a lot of the things that happen. And everybody says, oh, well, they're just having an off day. And one of my favorite things is, oh, he's going through some stuff or he's got issues or let's call it what it is. They got sin in their life. It's unresolved. It could be unforgiveness. It could be any number of different things that's going on. But what it really boils down to is what that person is spending their thought life on. See, that's where we get to the mental health side of spiritual warfare. It's when we're fighting against something that all we have to do is gain the knowledge and power that we can evict that thing at any time. See, oftentimes Christians view mental illness as a spiritual problem. Now, my goal this morning is to not say that every mental illness is a spiritual issue. I don't want to get into that argument. I don't want to get into that fight. All I'm trying to do this morning is say that there is a correlation between spiritual warfare and mental health. And how we overcome the challenges and struggles that we face in both domains. See, I've heard a lot of stuff over the years, and I've got to be honest, I'm going to address some of those things today, but some of the things that I've heard over the years have just, they, they make me sad because when I hear them, I know that that's not what God intended for us. So if we take a look at point number one, spiritual warfare can cause or worsen mental health problems. Again, I'm not saying it's the only cause. So I'm not getting into that argument. Y'all with me? We, we can argue about that. I know there's, there's people on both sides of that fence, and I'm not on either side of that fence. I'm just saying it could cause or worsen mental health problems. See, spiritual warfare can manifest as mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. For instance, some people may experience spiritual attacks that exacerbate their symptoms and disrupt their lives. See, depression is something real easy to take a look at because um, most people that have depression are not clinically diagnosed as depressed. There is a difference. If I'm going through a lot of stuff, I could be like, man, I'm fighting depression. There is somebody that is really fighting depression a lot worse than me, okay? I might be just fighting a bad mood. (laughs) They're going through it. But if you've ever or are currently thinking any one of these things, my life is meaningless. I haven't even made a difference yet. I don't know if I will make a difference. When I die, what is my legacy going to be? I have nothing to be thankful for. I don't know if God can even hear my prayers. I can't see his face or hear his voice anymore. Does he hear me? Does he even exist? This is just who I am. I always feel this way. I know I may seem down, but that's just how I am. I'm just a negative person. I don't understand why anybody would want to be my friend. I don't understand why anybody would like me or love me. If those are thoughts that you've ever had or that you even think right now, these are all signs that you or someone is going through that depression. But what it boils down to for a lot of people is what I'm going to refer to as an identity crisis. See, because if you know who you are in God, none of those thoughts no longer apply. God's word refutes each and every single thing that I said. Almost everything that we can think or do negatively about ourselves, God has a scripture specifically for that thing. See, even Moses, when Moses was called by God, what was the first thing that Moses did? I can't, because I stutter. 
When called by God, the first thing Moses did was point to his own limitations. And sometimes we, we take on our limitations as our identity. You know, a lot of people think, well, oh, well, that's Tom. He's, he's the minister. Or that's Tom. He's a, he's a manager at the shipyard. But who is, who am I? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I was created by God. I was created in his image. See, all of those things that we assign as our identity are not our identity. And I'm not even going to talk about identity. Because the, there's only one that matters. The identity that matters is the identity that God gives you. See, no matter what you think negatively about yourself, in two scriptures, we can tear every single one of those things down. Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Where was it that said God plans for you to be depressed and miserable? Yeah, I couldn't find that one. But I did find another one in Jeremiah. In 1.5 it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before we were born, God gave us an identity. But we come along later and try to change it. We're trying to change something that was assigned before we were formed in the womb. And see, the funny thing about God is the fact that God is eternal. So we need to understand that the identity that he gave us before we were born is going to be the identity that we carry our entire lives. We need to evict anything that goes against that identity that Christ gave us. Yeah. See, some of the things that we do to change our identity... Some of the causes of spiritual warfare. Sin. Disobedience. Unforgiveness. Idolatry. Involvement in the occult. All of those kinds of things can open us to influences by engaging in any practice that's contrary to God's will. See, when we start to invite other things in, then we start to change the landscape of our mind. Once we start to change that landscape, it doesn't change the foundation. I need everybody to understand the foundation is still there. The foundation was formed before the universe. We were formed in the, before we were formed, the foundation was laid. That foundation is yesterday, today, forever. It's not going to change. But we let tenants come in to change the landscape. How many of y'all live in a neighborhood where you look at everybody moving into the neighborhood? Like, are they going to bring my property value down? <laughs> yeah. And Bob, two doors down, I think he's selling drugs. You can have the nicest neighborhood in the world. You get one car on blocks, all of a sudden, the neighborhood doesn't look so nice anymore. Some of us need to get those thoughts off blocks in our minds. Take them to the junkyard. See, another thing that can open you up to attack, y'all are going to love this one, is obedience. I'm not even going to read the whole scripture. I'm just going to start the scripture. <laughs> Have you considered my servant Job? For those of y'all that didn't necessarily get that, Job's test came because he chose 
to worship God anyway. Everything that he went through was because he refused to not worship God. And that got me to thinking, well, if I can do bad things to get attacked and I can do good things to get attacked, then what do I do to not get attacked? And here's the answer for you. The attack is inevitable. See, spiritual warfare isn't a war that is coming. It's a war that's here. It's a war that's been here ever since Satan got cast out of heaven. And you know when it's going to be over? When Jesus comes back. So if at any point you feel like you are not going through spiritual warfare... Take a real quick look to see what side you're actually on at that point in time in your life. I'm sorry, that was that was definitely meddling. That 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 I was there were definitely some toes involved on that one. But see, many times we feel stuck in that valley. We don't know how long that we've been in there or how much longer we're gonna have to go through it. But see, one of the things that my wife and I do when we're going through that valley, no matter how long we've been in it, no matter how deep that valley gets, no matter how dark that valley gets, my wife and I, we always look at each other and go, wow, God must be about to do something really good. We must be on the edge of a major breakthrough because Satan is doing everything in his power to tear us down. Come on, Lord, let's see what that blessing is. We're going to keep walking through the valley until we get out of it. See, we need to recognize and resist the schemes of the enemy. The more you know about the enemy, the more you know that his tactics are the same. He doesn't have anything new. He doesn't have any new weapons. The very first thing that he did in the Garden of Eden was lie. What is the very first thing, or what is the thing he does now? Lies. What is the only thing in his power? Lies. What is the one thing he uses to get everybody to do what he wants? Lies. What does everybody believe? Okay, so... The only way that you can avoid believing the lies is to learn the truth. Now, thankfully, we got a manual for that. We got a book for that. I'm not going to ask how many of y'all read your Bibles every single day. I'm not going to ask by show of hands how many of y'all study the Word. Because I'm afraid not every hand will go up. Pretty sure not every hand will go up. But here's the thing. The more you know about the truth, the easier it is to recognize the lie. You have got the winning weapon in front of you. So why don't we read it and study it and learn it like the weapon that it is. See, last week I talked about the Word of God being the only offensive weapon that we have. The Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, it's the only thing offensive that we have. Why don't we use it? It's because the enemy tries to put all kinds of things in our lives. How many of y'all would say, I don't really have time to read my Bible every day? See, because that's the excuse I used to use. I ain't got time. I can sit down and watch TV for an hour. I don't have time to read my word. I play a video game for an hour. I don't have time to read my word. I can sit and play, sit and scroll Facebook and Instagram on my phone for two hours. But I ain't got time to read my word. I'm tired in the afternoon. I can take a nap for two hours, but I, I don't have time to read my word. See, we tend to not prioritize the things that we need to sometimes because the cares of the world take over. But we need 
to recognize and resist the schemes of the enemy. We need to, we need to learn the truth. And here's one of the things that I need. To, I want to emphasize this. If you, if you get nothing else out of today, I want you all to hear exactly what I'm about to say now. We need to recognize and resist the schemes of the enemy and to seek professional help when necessary. For instance, some people may benefit from counseling, medication, or therapy in addition to prayer and spiritual support. Okay, I have this written in all caps, so I'm yelling at myself when I say this. So just, just so y'all know. It is not mistrust in God for Christians to seek counseling or therapy. Yeah, I'm going to say it again for the people in the back, the people online, the people in the parking lot, and the people driving on the street. It is not mistrust in God for Christians to seek counseling or therapy. If anybody tells you that it is, Proverbs 24, 6 says this, For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. I have heard so many times people say, oh, you're getting counseling or you're going to therapy. You must not trust in God. God's the only therapist that you need. That is a lie. I've heard it in churches. I've heard it outside of churches. I've heard it from people all over the place that, oh, well, if, if you really saved, you don't need to go see a therapist. I want to read that scripture one more time. Because see, it was Psalms 24, 6. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war. Sounds like, sounds like somebody in Proverbs knew that we'd be dealing with some spiritual warfare. But it goes on to say, and in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. So not only did they know that we would be going through a battle, they they knew how we could win. And I'm going to tell you what, if you're letting too many negative thoughts live rent-free in your head, you are not providing yourself with the best counsel. You're probably not reading the scriptures to get the truth that you need to battle the lie. Sometimes you got to get it from somewhere else. Whether that be a Christian counselor, or a minister, a pastor, or something. The scriptures over and over and over and over again tell us to seek help. In fact, just for almost as many scriptures that say to seek wise counsel, there's just as many scriptures that say only a fool does not. Anybody in here still think that it's not? Christian to go to counseling? Because I will, I'll stand on that one all day long. We'll fight. Come on. <laughs> because I've heard, I've heard and seen too many people go down a path of depression that they can't pull themselves up out of and think that it's a sin to get help for. The torment that that person must be going through in their mind. I'm going to get off that soapbox. Okay, so point one was spiritual warfare can cause or worsen our mental health problems. But point two is mental health problems can hinder or harm our spiritual growth. So this goes both ways. See, mental health issues can affect our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with others. Some people may struggle with faith, hope, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering. People, those things that people suffer with, I want you all to notice that most of those things are fruits of the Spirit. See, when you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, those are the things that are supposed to come out. But if all that negativity is put in, then only that negativity can come out. We can let it come out two ways. We can let it come out in our relationships or we can throw it in a trash can and let God take care of it. We'll tell you right now, throw it in a trash can, let God take care of it. Because there are times where I'll be mad about something and I'll say something. I know everybody, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that's mad about everything and blow up on someone that didn't deserve it. I'm not the only one. We've all been there, right? We're just having the worst day in the world. Every negative thing you possibly think of is coming, 
Come, coming to you, you get home, and somebody look at you and be like, hey, how was your day? And you're like, ah! Biting their head off because they said, how was your day? And you thought that they were being sarcastic. See, we got to be careful what lies we're letting come in. We always got to we always got to take anything that is said and we got to bounce it against the truth, bounce it against the word of God. Let the fruits of the spirit in, keep the lies out. It'll save you from a lot of different things. Many times mental health issues are brought on by something that is very traumatic in our lives. Whether it's abuse when they were little or whether it was some type of PTSD situation or some really, really traumatic situation. Why is it that mental health disorders come from very traumatic situations? Because when you live through something that's very, very traumatic, what does it do to your mind? The thoughts of that trauma live in your mind. You give those thoughts time. You let them brew. They continue to brew. They continue to grow stronger and stronger and stronger until they affect your very identity. But see, we can be affected by any thought that we give our time to. And I'm not trying to take anything away from people that have been through abuse or people that have PTSD. I'm not trying to take anything away. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, oh, just don't think about it. I've got some things that live in my mind that I can't not think about. But every time I think about them, I've got to say, you know what, God? I can't dwell on that thought. Because when I dwell on that thought, I start to have some of the old emotions, the BC emotions. How many of y'all still got BC emotions every once in a while? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the, the way your mindset was before you came to Christ. See, I still get some of those thoughts sometimes, and I have to, real quick, I've got to take them captive because I will act on some of them. Which is why when we first read the scripture, I want, I'm going to read the scripture that we started with again, the, the 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I'm going to read that again, but I'm going to highlight some words for you. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. That's a mental thing. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge and take every thought captive. Every single thing that that scripture said that we need to do is based off of something up here. It's not based off of how, how big of a knife you carry or how big of a sword you carry or in today's society, how big of a gun you carry. Or, it's not based on any of that. It's all based off what's up here. And if the enemy can trick us into believing those things that are up here, then what are we not going to do? We're not going to do the things that we need to do to refute those negative thoughts and opinions that come up here. See... The more time we spend thinking about the trauma, the deeper the issue can go. And when I, when I reread Philippians 4, 8 last night, and I reread this, I was like, that makes so much more sense now. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you can't think of anything positive, find something positive to think about. Because the more time we spend thinking about positive things, guess what? The better our mental health gets. We can be affected by any thought, positive or negative, that we ponder, that we continue to think on. And I know, again, I'm pleased, I know I'm not the only one I'm not going to point any fingers, but I know I'm not the only one that will sit there and go over an argument in my mind for a couple of hours after the argument's happened. I know I'm not the only one. Do you think the other person is doing the same thing? Probably not. We like to think they are. Oh, when they come back at me later today and say this, I'm going to go back and they don't care anymore. From their perspective, it may not even have been an argument. They may just have been having a conversation, but we took it wrong. 
But we let all those negative thoughts run in our mind. Well, I should have slapped him. <laughs> like, we, we've taken it from a mental thing to a physical thing in our own mind. And now we're mad at somebody for weeks just because of what we didn't say. It's, it's, it's not all that, I promise. <laughs> But see, some of the possible consequences of neglecting or ignoring our mental health can be isolation, despair, guilt, shame, anger, bitterness. Those are all self-inflicted things. We tend to withdraw from people and then wonder why people are withdrawing from us. Or we stop going to church because we think that the people there are looking at us a certain way or judging us a certain way. So we draw into isolation and that's the exact thing that the enemy wants. When, and it, when, it, when a lion is looking for what zebra he wants to go after, what does he do? Look for the one by itself. As soon as he sees the one by itself, that's where he goes. Enemy does the same thing. So when we start to draw back, we look at it like we're not drawing back. Everybody's drawing away from us. It's, but it's us that's pulling back. See, when people withdraw from God, withdraw from themselves, and withdraw from others, they start to lose their, the sight of their purpose and their identity. Because when you're around other people, Scripture says iron sharpens iron. When you're around people that are like-minded, then they can build you up. We build each other up, and they remind you of your identity. They remind you of your purpose. But what's the first thing we do when we start to withdraw to ourselves? We start to seek out negative people that are going to agree with our negative thoughts. And when people start to agree with your negative thoughts, then that gives your negative thoughts power. See, just like positive thoughts, when two people come together in agreement, those positive thoughts can have power. The same thing happens with the negative ones. I know that there are people out there that will seek wise counsel from 100 different people until they can find at least one person that agrees with them. <laughs> See, when this happens, it's easy for the attacks to come. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not neglect our own meetings as the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more so as you see the day approaching. See, that scripture tells me one thing. This isn't going to get better. It's not going to get easier, and it's not going to slow down. Spiritual warfare is a battle that is going to rage on until Jesus returns. And when you look at any, when you look at any situation like the animal kingdom, what happens when you corner an animal? That's when they become the most vicious. Even when somebody's going through what, what they call the end of life process, the very last step in end of life they call the rally. It's where the person has a dramatic 180 degree turn and everything looks fine. And then the next day, they're gone. But it's that, it's that final fight, the last little bit of energy being expended. This says that we need to be together, that we need to worship together, even more so as you see the day approaching. As that battle gets more and more fierce, it is going to be so much more vital for us to come together in fellowship. We need to care for and nurture our mental health and to, speak the, or and to seek the help when necessary. Point three, and this is a short one. God can heal and restore our mental health and spiritual life. God can intervene and transform our situation regardless of how hopeless or helpless we may feel. And I'm going to tell you why, and it's something that I said earlier. He knew us before we were formed in the womb. He knows the plans that he has for us. All he has to do is get us to see him. And the only way that we can do that is to get out of our situation, get into the truth, stop believing the lies. See, some people experience this through miraculous healing. Some people get it through deliverance. Some people get it through breakthrough or restoration by the power of God. I remember after I got saved, I was still a very bitter person after I got saved. I wasn't one of the instantly, instantly changed people. I used to get jealous of the instantly changed people. 
Because I was like, I was like, you guys saved, you quit smoking, drinking, swearing, became happy, like all at the exact same moment. Like I, I still want to smoke every once in a while, but I don't. I've been saved for a long time now. <laughs> I'm like, where, where's my instant stuff? Like my instant stuff taking years. But I know it's happened. I know that I've gotten that deliverance. Just because that deliverance hasn't come to its full fruition, I know it's there. See, it was probably a couple of years after I got saved that I was sitting in church one day and I was like, you know, I just, I don't feel any different anymore. And let me tell you, not two seconds after I said that, God broke me. And at the time, I was over at Bethel Temple where they had two services, first service and second service. And I decided to go to first service that day because I didn't want to see anybody in second service. I was like, all my friends go to second service. I don't want to be around anybody today because I just want to wallow in my own pity because I don't feel no different. So I don't want to see none of my second service friends. I'm going to go to first service and be gone before anybody shows up. When God broke me during first service, when I was done being broken, it was halfway through second service. <laughs> all my friends were sitting around me. All right, God, where are we going for lunch? <laughs> but God can do that. All we need to do is trust that he will, trust that he can, ask him to do it. If there's something that's still living in your mind rent-free, ask God to evict it for you. If you're having a hard time getting that thought out of your mind, ask God to do it, and he will. Ask the people that are around you, the people that you're close to, like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. See, we need to be open with people. You know, I've said it before, and I've, it's something that I've always heard. It's like one of the biggest lies ever told is on Sunday mornings where people say, oh, I'm good. Most of us are not good most of the time. I can tell you with everything going on in my mind right now, emotionally, I feel like I'm walking on a piece of dental floss. Not even a tightrope. Tightrope's too thick. Like, I'm on, a, I'm on an edge, but you know what? I know the edge that I'm walking on has a really good foundation. See, the foundation of that edge keeps me at least walking. Because as long as I'm moving forward, I'm not going backwards. And that's the only thing I can do some days. Some days all I can do is continue to drag myself forward a little bit. But you know what? Dragging myself forward a little bit is better than taking two steps backwards. So I just got to keep dragging myself forward. I tell you what, right now, I am in a dragging season. Some people may be in a running forward season. Some people may be in a walking forward. Some people may be flying forward. Some days you're in a dragging season or a crawling season where it's everything you can to just move forward a little bit every single day. But you know what? Keep moving. Yeah. Keep going forward. Don't stop. Because when you stop is when the, when the enemy is going to look at you and be like, yeah, now's my time. I got you. See, we need to trust and we need to follow God. We need to share our testimonies with other people. Revelations 12, 11 says this, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Some people may be going through the valley so that they can be a witness to God's goodness, faithfulness, and sovereignty, and so that they can encourage others who are going through similar struggles. You know, I've often thought, why did this person have to go through that? Like, there's a person that I knew that was, that was stuck in the middle of drug addiction and stuff for years and years and years and years. And it's like to the, to the point where this person overdeed several times, almost died several times. And I'm like, why did they have to go through all that? But I'll tell you what, that person now helps people get clean by the power of God. They have an experience that it doesn't matter how many people I talk to about getting free from drugs, I will never be able to be as effective as him. That is a weapon that God has given him, not me. There are other weapons that God gave me that they didn't give him. But see, we all have our own story. We all have our own testimony. We all have our own weapons that we can use to defeat the enemy. And it isn't until we all come together that we have everything covered. See, because when we try to be the lone wolf, we may be able to witness to this group or that group, but we're not going to be able to help everybody until we actually work as a team. Yeah. So that was it for point three. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to sum everything up by saying this. Spiritual warfare and mental health are linked. We need to address both aspects with wisdom and faith, and we need to check on each other. Not just during Mental Health Awareness Month, 
We need to check on each other all the time. You know, it's funny because they started Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. What is it, November? It started a couple of years ago, as if, as if it was just a couple of years ago that men started having bad mental health. Why don't they have a Women's Mental Health Awareness Month? Oh, that's right, y'all talk to each other. <laughs> See, sometimes as men, we were raised to not be open, to not talk to each other. So, ladies, check on your men. A lot of times they are not fine. Because sometimes we feel like we have to carry the weight of the world when all we got to do is give it to God. But we try to carry the weight of our job, the weight of our household, the weight of everything we got going on. But all we got to do sometimes is just say, God, I trust you to handle this stuff. Because my shoulders are not broad enough. So I challenge you to apply the lessons that you learned from today to recognize and resist the enemy by learning the truth, to care for and nurture your mental health, and to trust and follow God. Will you stand? I can't pretend to know everything that everybody is going through. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that all mental illness is spiritual warfare. I'm not again, not getting into that fight, but hopefully one thing that you have seen today is that there is a link. And it's my prayer for you guys that whatever it is that you're going through that you can learn the truth of your situation. Learn your identity in Christ. So that when the enemy tells you the lie, you can let the enemy know what the truth is. See, because the enemy knows the word too. And he will try to twist it. Just change that one word to make it a lie. And those are the ones that we most often believe. So if you have anything going on in your life where you're dealing with something that deals with mental health or depression or unforgiveness or anything that I've talked about during this sermon, I just, I want to see people get set free. Just like I was talking about a minute ago, it takes the team. We've got people up here at the altar. If you want to come up to the altar, come on up and we'll pray for you. If you, if you don't want to come up, turn to the person next to you and say, hey, will you pray with me? But the thing is, we need to be a community. We need to use each other's strengths. We need to use each other's testimonies, each other's stories to see everybody get set free, to see everybody get healed. God doesn't want us to be depressed. God doesn't want us to be downtrodden or in a place where we feel like there's no hope. He's the God of hope. It's really hard to worship him when we don't feel like we're in that place. So I just want to encourage everybody, if you need prayer, seek it. And again, I'm not going to belabor this because, like I always say, if I can talk you into something, someone else can talk you out of it. But this is a personal choice that each and every single one of you needs to make at some point. And that's whether or not you're going to open up and let other people in to pray for you. If you don't make that decision here today, make it soon. Call somebody. Say, you know what? I know I didn't respond Sunday, but I really need prayer about this. Make a phone call. We'll pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I ask you, Father God, to just touch each and every single person, Father God, not just the people in here, but the, the people that are watching online. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to minister to them, Father God, that you would just allow them to reflect on themselves, Father God, to, to take a deep dive, Lord Jesus, and look within themselves and see what it is, Father God, what lies they are believing, Father God. The things that they need to address, that they need to give to you, Father God, so that their mind is not plagued with negativity, Father God, so that their mental health can be in a good place, so that the spiritual warfare, Father God, that they can be in a place to fight the good fight, to stand on your word, Father God. 
God, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And we just ask you, Father God, where there is need, that you would fulfill that need. Where there is lack, you would provide. Where there is depression, that you would just touch that person, Father God, and show them the identity that you gave them before they were even created in the womb. God, your word says you know the plans that you have for us to give us a future and a hope. I just speak that future and hope over each and every single person right now, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you would just allow your people to go with mercy and grace, Father God, that they would have traveling mercies, that you would continue to watch over and bless your people. I pray, Father God, that you would love on them where they don't feel warmth, Father God, I pray that you would wrap your arms around them. Shower them with your love, Father God. God, we thank you. We praise you for everything that you are, everything that you've done, and everything that you're going to do. God, you are such an awesome God, and we lift you up in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.